Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Couple weeks and I'd go crazy, crazy. Yeah, I need you on the regular, the regular. Yeah, I need you. Yeah, I'm telling ya, I'm telling ya. Yeah, I need you on the daily, daily. Hi, welcome to Divas with Debbie. So, another day in lockdown at the country where I am. Uh, today we're just going to look at one chapter, but it's going to take us to the New Testament too. So we're going to look at Isaiah 17. And this is um, Isaiah's prophecy, his oracle concerning Damascus, just talking about the fate of Damascus. And obviously we want a little bit of history here if we're going to understand it for a deeper context. And I just don't know that much about Syria to begin with. Um, uh, about Syria historically or modern history right now. Um, I know a little bit about the refugee crisis going on in Syria, uh, but not not enough to really teach anything. But looking at a map, let's just see where we have um, Damascus, which is right here in Syria. You can see the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see Jerusalem down here. Um, so what we learn about Damascus, based off of Isaiah 17, is that from verse 1 we see, Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. And it goes to sort of recount that this glory that it had will be crushed and trampled upon, um, and what it had will be taken from him you know, sort of saying this abundance, um, this prosperity that you had is going to just flee away. Even if you plant it, it, it gives the image of planting, which is helpful. It says, like, though you plant pleasant plants and sow the vine branch of a stranger, though you make them grow on the day that you plant them and make them blossom in the morning that you sow, yet the harvest will flee away in a day of grief and incurable pain. So not only do we see this destruction and taking away of this prosperity, but we see this devastation, grief and incurable pain. So we know the end of Damascus is not pretty. Um, but in, in throughout this chapter, we have little glimpses that are super interesting that teach us about Damascus and also teach us about some parts of the New Testament and how we should live our lives too. So little mini thoughts. Let's start with verse 7 and 8. It says, In that day, so the day of destruction, the day of fate that Damascus is going to have, when everything is laid to ruins, it says, In that day, man will look to his maker, and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the works of his hands, and he will not look on what his own fingers have made, either Asherim or the altars of incense. So Asherim is an idol, or like the altars where they worship. Uh, wow, how fascinating. In this day of destruction, people will return to looking to God, their maker, not at what their hands made, not at what they did, not at the gods they had chosen to worship and follow. But that day, man will look to his maker and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. And it just reminds me um, how easily distracted our eyes are um, when things seem to be going well. Um, in times of prosperity, our focus turns inward to ourselves or outward to our successes or outward to the world or our performance, whatever it may be. But somehow our eyes just deviate from God. Um, just like in Second Corinthians 4, it talks about like, let fix our eyes not on what is seen, unseen, no, 
fix our eyes not on what is seen but what is unseen for what is unseen is temp in la 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 we're gonna try that again fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen because what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal um i think that's verse 16 17 18 around there i think 18 but um yeah our eyes are fixed on what is seen not on what is unseen and yet in these moments of crisis of uh, devastation of pain our focus returns to god um Verse 10 in chapter 17 reminds us of that again. It says, For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and you have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Again, in, in times of prosperity, we develop spiritual amnesia, <laughs> and um, our eyes are just bouncing everywhere but what really matters. Um, so... Along with that thought, um, my mind was just taken to the other association I have with Damascus. I just don't know that much about history or anything. Sadly, I have failed <laughs> in my like fourth grade history classes or whatnot. I don't remember. But um, my mind jumps to the story of Saul who became Paul on his road, on the road to Damascus. And Damascus was actually where Ananias was. Um, this is all, like, starts, the story starts in Acts 9. And we see an interesting thing here, where in Isaiah 17, he's, he's talking about their focus. Their eyes will turn to their maker. Their eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. And in in Paul's journey to Damascus, when he encounters Jesus, it is with this blinding light and this voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, like, who are you? And the response is, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he says, get up, like, go to Ananias, and has all these instructions. And Ananias is the believer who meets with Saul and helps change and helps his eyes be opened spiritually to what the scriptures actually said. And then his eyes are opened physically to see again. He was blinded and then he sees again. And we get this interesting word of God to Ananias affirming who he has chosen Saul to be. He says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. Saul, whose name changed to Paul later, um, so I'll just refer to him as Paul now. Paul was a chosen instrument of God to preach the truth, not only to Israelites, to the Jewish people, but also to the Gentiles, to the nations, to the world. God's chosen instrument. I love that image. Chosen instrument. Um, his eyes are spiritually opened on his way to Damascus. And perhaps, you know, we don't, I don't fully understand what this oracle is talking about in one sense. But in another sense, I see, like in, in the historical, because I just don't know history, or even in the prophetic sense, like what does Damascus, Damascus symbolize? I don't know. But what I do know is there's something about Damascus and sight and how it, even in these tragedies and destruction of Damascus, it results in eyes focused on Jesus, which is really what God wants, you know, even in our times of prosperity and in our lowest times of devastation. He wants our eyes focused on him. Um, and, and there's something about the road to Damascus where God punches people, I think, 
wake up and they see with clear vision. And I can't help but think as I'm processing this in my own quiet time, just think of this old song that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know, in light of 2 Corinthians 4, Acts 9, and Isaiah 17, we can say clearly that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, things make sense. We don't need those altars. We don't need the works of our hands to give us value or importance. And we don't need um, anything else other than eyes focused on Jesus. The things of this earth, the scene, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So I hope this encourages you. Sorry for rambling a little bit, but have a good day and I'll see you guys later. Bye.